that's devoted to painting and drawing from life. Uh, today I'm going to be working from a small sketch that I did from life right there on the site. A uh, very small sketch as a matter of fact. It's only about five inches or four and a half inches by 12. That's a small sketch uh, of a large area. This happens to be Smith Point Beach on the southern part of our island here and it was done on a very brilliant summer day. But uh, these small sketches are very valuable because you bring them back and you, it's the way most of the great landscape works have been done from small sketches, color sketches, back into the studio and made them larger. I'm not going to go as large as people like Frederick Church went, nor uh, Bierstadt, but um, for the purpose of reducing a small sketch to a slightly larger one is the point of this program. And so uh, with my personal uh, on-site sketch, I'm going to start to lay it out for you. It's the simplest possible kind of layout. I call it a ribbon layout. Um, I'm, I've divided this, I've gotten rid of the top of this canvas because the sketch that I'm working from is very long and narrow and this canvas is too rectangular so I'm cutting it, cutting it right here. I, the, the nice part about these canvas boards, which is this, is that you can cut them with a razor blade when you need to. Uh, different from when you stretch your own canvases, you can't cut them, you have to stretch them to the proper size. So I'm going to lay this out uh, in, uh, the, um, in a very uh, interpretive manner by showing you that uh, there are three bands. There is the sky band, the land, and the foreground. So the sky band is, um, you, I would say that the general layout would be uh, just a, an arbitrary kind of set, setting of where these dunes and how they climb up towards the uh, right part of the canvas in, in a hilly uh, sort of a um, wavy pattern. The next, the next band indicated, and many, t many programs are doing landscape painting without any preliminary drawing, which I disapprove of tremendously. You must lay things out. Here is the center part of the composition. It's where the uh, beach flattens out. And the third one I don't have to put in at all because it's the entire foreground. So we have a two-line composition. This line of the dunes and the center line of the beginning of the flat beach. Naturally, there are details over here on the right. There is a grass, uh, an outgrowing of grass here. There's a little garbage can. There are some people in the foreground. But for the most part, this is a two-line composition. Um, certainly you can't ask for anything simpler than that, but at least it's a plan. At least it's a composition which does not sort of suddenly go off with a pre-painted uh, blue sky background and then you start throwing in the mountains arbitrarily here and there. This is at least a plan. Simple as it is, it's a plan. So I'm going to be start. I'm working in oils, of course, and I'm going to be starting to... I've got my palette set up on a piece of um, masonite. Uh, which is a good idea to start training if you're going to be painting on site to use anything flat and clean for a palette. You don't have to go out with mahogany $65 palettes. You can pick up a piece of flotsam from the beach if you want to. So I'm going to start in naturally you work from the uh, from the background towards the foreground. I'm going to be mixing the color of the uh, of the Long Island sky which is usually and I find this having painted this for many many years usually it is a co it is a combination basic combination of pure white and cerulean blue a touch of uh, of um, ultramarine and 
then you begin to grade it down towards the uh, paler colors of the horizon. Long Island has a particular atmosphere very special to it. It is, um, it's not found anywhere else. I have returned from uh, Europe and I find that the light over there, it comes from the same solar system, but the light is different. I don't know, I can't explain it and I'm not even gonna bother because I'm not a physicist. But I'm telling you that Long Island, through my observations of many years of painting the scene on Long Island, that the atmosphere here is unique and different. So, uh, maybe it's the flatness. Maybe the fact that it's between two large bodies of water and maybe it's because it's um, got uh, the East Coast Atlantic Ocean bathing its shores, whatever it may be, it's to be treasured and to preserved at all costs, certainly not to let it um, deteriorate. I think that probably there's more cerulean blue in this piece, so I'm going to just add that onto this wet paint. I'm working with a number eight square cut red sable brush uh, and in, with deliberate strokes. No, no great wide sweeps of um, four inch brushes here because I want to get some texture. And the term for that kind of texture is painterly. And when, it's, when it says, is it painterly enough, that means have you put the brush, the paint on with deliberate small and carefully studied strokes. Naturally, I'm not going to do a, a finished fine arts painting in a half an hour or even an hour, but um, for demonstration purposes, I think that it is wise to be able to, for me to tell you uh, about the, the way that you apply color. Um, when I do my live program, I get calls from people who want to know about the live, about the way you apply paint. And you apply paint uh, not wet on wet, but on a con prepared canvas, which by the way has been prepared with a darker tone purely for the television transmission. It seems that when you deal with a pure white canvas, it, uh, it uh, does uh, bad things electronically with the transmission, so I tint these a dark tone uh, purely. I don't do this ordinarily for myself. Now, uh, the, um, the um, color of this sky becomes rather mauve and uh, for some reason or another in the uh, in the pinkish mauve tones over here as it goes gets toward the sky and it gets a little bit deeper than that so I'm using a Grumbacher color called flesh I mean it's an absurd name for a color because flesh is not this color but that's what they've called it so if you see it in the store don't pay any attention to the fact that it's that it's named that but it's a wonderfully premixed smoky rose tone uh, that I find useful in many landscapes uh, because the sky picks up these smoky rosy tones at certain times of the year and certain times of the day right there where the uh, where the uh, where you're being shown that cloud that is a rather deep smoky mauve tone and uh, when you're working in oils of course you've got the advantage of having a uh, the ability to blend it very satisfactorily because the oils take a while to dry so you can blend these uh the beginning of when the sky goes from brilliant blue at the top and begins to blend towards the horizon you'll find that working with these small brush strokes and blending them in is vital for the look and the atmosphere that you're trying to that you're trying to capture of the long island sky um, let me uh, let me continue this uh, grading to mauve here. Uh, well, it should be a little bit darker than that. So some more of this so-called flesh tone. It's really silly because flesh is not that color. But nevertheless, uh, I use Grumbacher colors. I also use Winsor Newton, and I happen to uh, find that uh, they are well tested. They seem to have withstood time. I've been painting for 40 years, and uh, my paintings have not faded yet. So. Uh, the goal of wanting to paint something that isn't going to fade for, for 400 years is uh, still questionable, but 40 years is not too bad a test. So I find that if you buy what is called student colors or lesser brands, brands that are sort of unknown and they're all over the place because everyone's, everybody wants to make a killing on selling paints because it's a fast growing industry of the uh, consumer public to buy paints. Painting is in. Everybody wants to paint. So um, get the good color, get the good colors, otherwise you may live to regret it. All right, let me change my brush. Get one that is, uh, that is um, more, uh, it's got a, a different bristle. And I'm going to show you how clouds are accomplished without 
uh, relying upon uh, wiping off and crazy techniques that don't mean anything. Now, most clouds have got some kind of, a, of an amber tone. I'm mixing some white with spectrum yellow and some kind, uh, a touch of orange and also a touch of this flesh tone, which is rosy, because, um, well, clouds tend to be anything but really white. So let me show you how I apply the paint to the canvas here in the, uh, f for the effect of a billowing summer cloud. Y you must, uh, so many times, clouds change all the time. They are never the same. There's no formula for painting clouds. But we're using an average, general uh, way clouds are formed. Now, I've got that I've got this fairly sharp here, and then because the paint is wet, I can blend it and let it blend down into the rest of the sky, which is what clouds tend to do. They are not puffy little sheep running around up there, and they are not cotton balls. They have ways of, of, of um, fading in and out uh, with their tones. Here's another set, the same general idea of putting the top part rather well delineated and then blending the lower part as it uh, as it works its way down into the horizon these um these are things that are asked to me very often how do you do clouds you can keep going you try to vary the size of them and mind you clouds are changing all the time so you have to work rather quickly clouds are also subtle you uh, try to avoid um, too much contrast in the clouds. They tend to blend into their, ba their background, namely skies, depending upon the time of day, of course. And here you can find that some of them even become so pale that they're barely visible, but it's, the, it's that subtlety which makes, them, which makes some of these Long Island landscapes of mine um, very typical, that they are um, very subtly painted. Over here, I seem to, my little sketch tells me that I've got a kind of a more, uh, more a deeper pink cloud um, that is f fading off into the mauve of the, uh, of the horizon. The sun changes things, atmosphere changes things, so if there's a pink cloud, let me, let me push this forward, see, that's better. When there, if there's a pink cloud over on the, uh, on the east, there's some reason for it. I never question it. I simply paint what I see. Let me see if I can get rid of that reflection. Well, we're dealing with a problem here that has reflections which, because the oil paint is wet. Uh, now, so I've got to the beginnings of the sky arrangement. In the studio, one would do a tremendous amount more detail in uh, dealing with this sky, but for demonstration purposes, I'm, I'm not going to go any further with it right now. Maybe uh, if time allows, I will pull a little bit more detail and show you what I mean by that. Um, uh, the brush, as you can see, I keep cleaning it and I keep uh, rinsing it in turpentine because one of my other mottos is not just work from life, it's keep your brushes clean. That's how you avoid getting muddy paintings that you hate and don't know why. It's because the colors have not been kept clean and pure. So the best way you can do that is to rinse your brushes. All right, we're coming to the middle the middle ground. I'm going to change my brush and take this one. This is a square cut uh, red sable brush. It's a number, it's a Winsor Newton from England and it's a number six. Uh, it's wonderful for landscape paintings. Um, try to remember that thing. All right, I'm using something called sap green. I have been disparaging green colors for a long time, but sap green is the one that I find that I can accept. I never use it pure. I use it always um, diluted with some other color. Now I'm going to uh, just dilute it with a little bit of pale color that I've gotten from the sky arrangement and maybe some mauve to tone it down because if it's too brilliant, then it's really amateurish. Foliage is never as brilliant as some of landscape paintings that you see. So you work against the, the wetness of the sky and because, uh, because I'm working from a sketch, I'm going to try to capture as much of the atmosphere as I possibly can in the application of this. Well, this brush isn't working, so I'm going to change it to a different one. Well, here we are, another square cut brush. It's fine. Um, I'm not using a medium tonight. I, I, I sometimes use a medium, but to, now I'm using pure color because I think that it's not fair to use different 
uh, materials and tell you that you can do this. So I'm using exactly what you will buy, what you, what you buy in the art supply stores yourself. You will find these colors available exactly the way I use them. No fa special fancy mediums, no magic anything, no magic tubes of anything that's going to shortcut. This is just the colors as they come out of the tube, however, mixed in a certain way. So here is the Here's the grassy knoll at the top from the little sketch that I'm doing. It becomes kind of pale here. A little bit of pale green has been introduced. Uh, I'm introducing the pale green here because foliage grows in different patterns. And it breaks and then it begins to become um, dark again. So. As I say, trying to do this from imagination or from a recall is virtually impossible. Uh, we have to get out into the scenery. While I'm doing this, I'm going to break for just a moment to get another supply of cloths, and I'll be right back. So don't leave me yet. When you're looking for high school sports, look this way. again, uh, working on this scene from Smith Point Beach. A uh, slight uh, digression from the work at hand. I have a brush in my hand that I bought the other day in an art shop. Uh, there was a special sale on this brush. Now see the size of this brush? This brush is a number four sable round. Not very big. The price of it is $12.30. Uh, I picked it up for $6.15 and thought that I had stolen it. So when you talk about brushes uh, and taking care of them, uh, that's one of the reasons that uh, a, little, a little thing like this uh, re, uh, sells for $12.50, unless you're, of course, a tremendously clever shopper such as I, can pick them up for six. It's still a lot of money. So brushes are the important part and to be taken care of very carefully. Uh, I'm now at the point where the little beach house has loomed into sight. Uh, it's a kind of a grayish structure. It, uh, it can be put in with, um, I'm, I'm working for my sketch, of course, and it can be put in right now because it's a part of the background and uh, the dune is going to go in front of it. So uh, a, touch of, a touch of ivory black, a touch of this flesh tone, and a little touch of orange is making the color uh, that I'm after. This little, these little uh, beach houses that are put up by the, um, I believe, Suffolk County, Suffolk County Parks Department are um, very typical. I haven't seen them anywhere else, but these, but here, I don't know who designs them, but they're really rather charming. They've got, um, they've got wood at the bottom, and um, they're structures which house something. Uh, I'm not quite sure. They, it may be trash cans. It may be um, first aid station. But nevertheless, they're there as little beacons on the beach, and. Um, if you put one of those in, and anybody knows Long Island, they're going to know that that's, that that's very typical. There's a little door which can be, see, this is really very difficult of, for me to try to, oh, that's better, for me to try to get you to see it because of these reflections. Here's the shadow that that roof is casting, and here's the door to be put in with just one stroke, if possible, to tell you, oh, there's some, some other little structure there, so let, let's put that little roof line in also to its, um, to its, uh, its right. And these are mysterious little structures, but to be put in there to, to retain the flavor. Somewhere above, there is a little vent system and a little pale, uh, sort of, it looks like a little pale chimney up there. Chimney or something. 
there's also an American flag flying, I believe, um, next to this little thing. And that's almost impossible to put in in such a small uh, area. So you would indicate it with just a va vague suggestion of a flag. And you see, I'm dealing with really tiny stuff here. But uh, that's part of the business of being a realist painter. So there's a little bit of, there's a little blue thing up there. And maybe this is going to, um, maybe it'll be um, <laughs> believable when I finish it. Uh, just a suggestion of the stripes. Let's see if I can pull this off. Uh, uh, I remember when I did the sketch, I thought, well, why would I fuss with this? Because it's hardly visible at all. And in any case, it is visible enough for it to, for me to tell you that these are the little details which are important. The flagpole, of course, has got to be in there to support it. So. Um, I'm working very fast, but I'm also trying to get, disseminate some valuable information to the people who may be really interested in going out and working with a small sketch and then coming back and trying to work it up in the studio. All right, the dune goes in front of it, uh, as you can see, in, 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 in a pattern, an arbitrary pattern of the growth of bushes. As, the, as, I, as I work towards the... Um, towards the upper part of the dunes, and then suddenly my little sketch tells me that there is a figure. Uh, a figure is walking up on the beach. Uh, that figure can be um, done in a very simple pattern. The darkness of the head, here's the darkness of the head. Now, hang on, I'm rinsing my brush. A touch of the white for a, apparently a shirt. Now, something tells me that that is fairly convincing as a human figure, even though it's minuscule. And here are two, here are the, here's a suggestion of legs walking across this dune. Now I'm interested in human beings in their environment, where, they're, where they happen to be walking, working, or whatever. And so uh, if you do, by any chance, see somebody walking into your painting, stop what you're doing and try to capture whatever that uh, whatever flavor there is to that figure. Uh, this figure is obviously climbing over a dune, and it has. To, and I, and I uh, when I was sketching, I apparently caught it, uh, caught this figure just as it was passing by. Um, this is, can only happen when you're working from life, when you're out there and activity takes place. Uh, this is what interests me, and I think this is what interests most of the landscape painters. Uh, and if anybody happens to be going down to the Washington area soon, be by before the end of February, there is a show at the National Gallery that must not be missed. It's one of the great land landscape painters of all time, an American painter called Frederick Church. It is a retrospective of his work. He's the man who painted the famous painting of Niagara Falls. So I was there, I saw it last week, and it is absolutely remarkable. So if anybody, that's my advice, my, my artistic adventure for the year is to go down and see the Frederick Church show at the National Gallery. This is where the dunes seem to break in, uh, in pattern and then become sand and then they you know, start in again and become, and this is a cut through, this is what, where everybody's trying to prevent the dunes from doing, is to be ruined by people walking on them. So this cut through here is maybe something that was done a while back. You are now no longer allowed to be on the dunes and the little figure that I just painted was breaking the law. Uh, f for the benefit of my picture, let's uh, hope that he doesn't make a habit of that because the Long Island sand dunes are in grave danger of being ruined forever by an uncaring public. Here I am uh, once again playing preacher, but it's vital that we pay attention to these things because they are beautiful and should be preserved. All right, I've got the... I've got this band, this middle band of the dunes against the sky and now the tricky part is to uh, put the dunes in below, and the dunes are, you think that they're all just pale something or other. They are, they are pale something or other, but they also have shadows uh, working in them. For the most part, the dunes are tinted white. I tint them with um, a touch, just barely a touch, hardly a touch of any of the orange. Uh, to get a, a little bit of a glow because they are in the summertime really very, very white uh, uh, and pristine clean in color on a brilliant day. But they, uh, the shadows on these uh, dunes, uh, interestingly enough, tend to be in the mauve 
patterns. So mauve being purple and a touch of, uh, of orange is going to give me the I, I believe it's going to give me the kind of, uh, no, it needs some, Turk so some cerulean blue. A little touch of blue need is needed here. I believe that this is going to be the color that I'm going to want for the, for the, um, the break in the dunes. Yeah. So, and also up near the grasses, there are touches of where the sand becomes deep and where it, where it flattens out. Mysterious, but all the dunes are not just a great white uh, band of um, sand running across. The, it has uh, ins and outs and ups and downs and so forth. So, as we as I go along and set up these uh, set up this band of, of dune, it's oh, it's to be remembered that the uniqueness of the Long Island landscape is caught in its dunes. And therefore, you should try to be as accurate as possible because you are actually documenting something. Uh, hopefully documenting something because it's worth documenting and also because if anything does severely happen to these dunes, uh, paintings such as these, of course, photographs and so on, can you be reference material for maybe many generations from now uh, that are, uh, you know, maybe need to re do these dunes, save them even more. They are definitely a um, national treasure, particularly on this island. And um, I hope I'm going to do this, uh, par this uh, program in two parts. This is obviously part one. The next part will come at the next uh, time that um, Cable Easel is being shown as a follow-up and as a completion of this study working from a small sketch. I hope that you got something out of it. Don't forget to tune in for the denouement of this painting of Smith Point Beach. Thank you for watching. This is Patricia Winder at the Cable Easel. Good night. Mm -hmm.